is a close friend of Marsha's, and that is the wonderful Randy Wicker. Reception and by all this happening in the world today revolving around Marsha B. Johnson. I just want to, uh, I'll tell you a few stories uh, that you might find amusing. There's literature over there on the table where you came in. Uh, but in the literature, which I had totally forgotten, I told this story in the literature asking for a flagpole to Marsha B. Johnson. As I said to Marsha one day, Marsha, you know, if we build a memorial, I'd like to build a memorial to you and then have a pond in front of it and people could come by, young lovers or anybody could come by and throw a coin into the fountain, make a wish. And then as the sun set, we've got the poor people come in and scoop up the coins, the homeless and the street people come in to scoop up the coins. I said, but I can't decide, Marsh. I was wondering, should I portray you as male or female? And Marsha said, oh, you know what I like? I want to have a statue where they came, two people came by, and one would put their hands on their chin and look at that statue and say, it's a woman. It's their hands on their chin, and they say, no, it's not, it's a man. <laughs> and this argument goes on and on. It's a woman, it's a man. No, it's a woman, no, it's a man. On and on and on. So, the funny thing is, how would you, how would you, to create such a statue as sort of like, uh, just unreal. I actually, at the end of the set, we should have the flag, a pole raised with a gay flag on it in memorial to Marsha, because at that time, the idea of a monument to Marsha B. Johnson was just unthinkable. But, you know, from the time I met Marsha, uh, way, way back, uh, the, one of the interesting things about her is, does, does anyone here know anyone or ever met anyone that they thought of as a living saint? I haven't, except for Marsha P. Johnson. There used to be a joke about Christians. Uh, I myself am a, a, a lapsed Catholic kind of non-believer, but anyway, the joke was the trouble with Christians is there was only one of them. Well, I'll tell you, Marsha P. Johnson came very close to being the second. <laughs> so you wonder, what's amazing about Marsha is that if you watch Pay It No Mind on, on YouTube, it's free. Pay It No Mind, The Life and Times of Marsha B. Johnson, they talked to a guy who was a flower vendor. They used to let her sleep under the flower stands up in the flower district. They said, why do you let her sleep there? And they say, because she's holy. And when she died, the, the centerfold of Wigstock, 1992, had a picture of Marsha with halos around her hair, her head, and described her as actress, uh, international star, prostitute, and always at the end, and saint. And I thought it was it's just amazing that Marsha was literally lost to history, in my opinion. I mean, she was always vividly in my mind, but you didn't hear anything about her. And one day in around 2012, I got a phone call from a fellow named Michael Casino. He said, I have this interview with Marsha. It's just sitting on a shelf and it's going to be going to waste. I want to finish it up in three days, uh, you know, to turn it into a film. Well, to make a long story short, he was a professional filmmaker. And he worked for the next three months because I had all these petitions. When people signed petitions to then tell me, oh, I have an interesting story to tell you about Marsha, I would mark it and make a note on these thousands of pages of petitions. So he began chasing down some of these people. When you see Pay It No Mind, you'll meet the woman. 
who said, oh yeah, Marsha used to babysit for me. And that was how they found us, who one of the signers of the petition had this story and he tracked that down. So it literally, instead of three days, it took him three months. And finally we had cut, it, cut down the story to a feature month film, and we opened it at IFC Theater here in New York City. And somehow word got out and there were still enough people that knew Marsha and remembered Marsha that it was the hottest ticket in town. I mean, I had 10 tickets. I remember one young woman coming up to me and saying, oh, please, I'm going back to LA tomorrow. Please, please help me get into this film. <laughs> and I sat there and I heard Marsha, was Marsha being interviewed and she's talking about her life. I began hearing people laugh, young people, really young people, young people even younger than most of you. And I was astounded, and I actually started to tear up, because to sit there and to hear people begin to fall in love with Marsha B. Johnson by visiting with her was so bad that I said, oh, I'm going to be on this panel, I can't be crying and getting up with all red eyes. So I actually went out to the lobby and said it was all over. And anyway, so that really, we put it on YouTube. After he put it on YouTube, he spent $5,000 of his own money. It was his creation. Uh, I actually, uh, when I found out it was going to be a gift to the world, I reimbursed him for the, his out-of-pocket expenses. It was his baby. I just covered the delivery charges. But that was... <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the beginning of what I'm going to call the rebirth of the, the Marsha rising from the grave because up to that point no one knew about her and suddenly I started seeing these videos on YouTube. There'd be a young uh, African American trans trans girl on there saying, "All these gay historians, how come they tell you all these stories but you don't see anybody like looks like that?" And there would be a picture of Marsha B. Johnson. <laughs> and they, and it was, I remember the girl was only 17 years old and I sent her an email saying, you know, it, it was just so touching. And this is where it began to build and build and build. And then finally, uh, as we know, David France, they got about 200,000 likes on YouTube. And also, we kept feeding in stories. I had all kinds of little video clips and all. There's a wonderful thing where she sings, You've Gotta Have Soul. Uh, there's a poem that she told on YouTube, which is just beautiful. And, and anyway, so when Marcia died, we, we had the investigation. It was declared not a suicide. You're right. Marcia would have never considered suicide. I never saw her sitting around in the 10 and more years that she lived with me saying, oh, I'm depressed today, or oh, I feel bad, or complaining. She didn't. If she, the bullet by her spine was acting up, she might flinch because she had a bullet lodged near the back of her spine. Some cab driver had shot her. Maybe I shouldn't tell this story, but I think you want to know. <laughs> she had gone with this guy for 10 or $20 or whatever, and he said, ooh, baby, that was so good, I want to go again. <laughs> and Marsha, Marsha said, oh no, I'm not doing all that work, and got up and walked away. <laughs> so this crazy cab driver, his macho male image was so shattered, with Marsha walking away, he had a gun, he pulled out and shot her in the back. And she ended up in the middle of the West Side Highway, and the bullet was so close to her spine, then when they took her to St. Vincent's to have it removed, they couldn't remove it. So they left the bullet there. And the bullet only bothered her when it got, got damp. You might see her occasionally flinch, but she never complained about it. And when Willie first asked me, Roy was my adopted son, asked me, could Marcia come here and sleep tonight? It's 10 degrees out and she doesn't have anywhere to go. Uh, I, he said, she can sleep on the living room floor. And I said, oh, uh, she won't steal, will she? And he said, oh, Marsha would never steal. And then he said, Marsha likes to sleep on the floor, on a hard floor. And he once told me something I thought was very intelligent, and that was, first they lie, and then they steal. 
And I thought of all the people that had stolen from me, and every one of them had lied to me first. So I'm thinking to myself, Willie, I know that you, you're not a thief. Why are you telling me this unbelievable story that Marsha likes to sleep on the floor? Well, she likes to sleep on the floor because when you have a bullet next to your spine, sleeping in a soft bed can cause it to act up. So she, it's true that she did like to sleep on a hard surface or a hard bed or a floor to keep that from happening. So I just want to end the story a little bit telling you about uh, how, when Marcia finally died, the reason that she was so, the reason she has become such a huge, literally international celebrity now. I mean, someone went to Istanbul from Baltimore, a young African American fellow who was active with the gay pride there and all, and he found a picture of Marcia on a telephone pole in Istanbul, Turkey. pictures and drawings and artwork sent to me from people in France and Germany and other countries all over the world. Marcia has become an international recognized figure of, of, of unbelievable proportions, especially compared to, say, Sylvia Rivera, who also is one of my dear departed friends. That's a whole different story because we were enemies till we made up at Marcia's funeral. So is it. <laughs> There's a great video called uh, Sylvia Rivera was more than just a just Stonewall. It's put up by the center, center video or something, and it really does a beautiful job of telling that story. But anyway, I just want to say that when finally in 1992, after Marcia's we've gotten Marcia's suicide corrected and uh, changed to cause unknown. Uh, I was really very, very alone. And it just happened that uh, Marcia's family, who I had met a few years earlier, invited me to come out to thank. In other words, I tell people, if you want to make black people laugh, I tell you what you do. You go out to some, ex some African American exhibit at a gay fair, and you say, you know, I, in 1992, I was simply a honky without a family. And this wonderful black family from Elizabeth called the Michaels family, you know, had sort of taken me in where I always had a place to go on Thanksgiving or holidays or summer fairs. And Norma Michaels was the most wonderful human being you ever want to meet. She was a very large woman, but I remember once I went to a Thanksgiving dinner and there was this kid that was kind of leaning against the wall, you could tell there was something wrong with him. And it just happened that I was driving Marsha and, I mean, Norma, and this boy back in my truck. And to hear this woman say to this poor boy, you know, do you, do you ever have problems? You want to talk to somebody? You can come over to Elizabeth and talk to me. Wow. <laughs> and to hear this, you wonder where where did all the love? That's what Marcia really was. She was a giant of love. And where did that love come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from her family, the Michaels family. Now, when you see Pay It No Mind, you'll hear her say that her mother said homosexuals were lower than a dog. <laughs> well, let me tell you, one day I went out to the family and I was actually at the flea market, and there were all these artificial flowers on the tray. I mean, it was a six foot long thing, and the flowers were 12 inches deep. And Marcia said, how much are the flowers? And they said, are you interested in the whole table full? And she said, well, how much would that be? And they said, $10. So Marcia, of course, said, I'll take them. And it just happened that she was going back to New York and would go by Elizabeth, to take the flowers and literally fill up the back of my truck. I'm telling you, you don't know how many flowers were on that table, but selling artificial flowers is not very popular in the antique flea market. <laughs> so Marcia's mother, when she walked in the door, you could just see her mother's face.